Thanks for coming. Uh, yeah, my name is Bertie Vidgen. Uh, I'm a DPhil student at the Oxford Internet Institute. Uh, my DPhil project is an examination of the far right, mostly in the UK, uh, but also across Europe. And today I'm going to be presenting on defining extremism. Um, and I'm doing this as part of the. That'll work. Yeah, which keyboard? Ah, I'm doing this as part of the uh, Oxford Extremism Research Network. There's our website. Uh, if you want to find anything more, just go there, have a look. This video will be on there and also our blog posts. Okay, so I start from a, a really basic question, which is just what is an extremist? Um, and I think it's actually a really tough question to answer. Uh, I think the real issue is how do we define what makes an individual or a group or even an ideology extreme in some way. Uh, and I've got a range of figures here. So I've got Britain first, I've got the ex-leader of the BNP, Nick Griffin, Adolf Hitler, ISIS, Hamas, uh, Golden Dawn, Osama bin Laden, Gert Wilders from the Netherlands, and then uh, radical anarchists from Germany. Um, and I think this really shows the sort of range of ideologies, the range of geographic locations, time periods, types of actors, ways of acting, and types of goals um, that we find when we talk about extremism. So extremism is a really complex picture. Um, this is going to get a bit difficult. And I think this picture is made a lot more complex when we think about the amount of political mudslinging there is and how loaded this term extremism has become. So this is Jeremy Corbyn. Um, he's the leader of the Labour Party and as such the leader of the opposition. Yet at the last Conservative Party conference, uh, David Cameron described him as a security threatening, terrorist sympathising, Britain hating ideologue. Um, and I think we have to be aware that terms like extremist, radical, populist are all just so loaded that at times they become almost devoid of meaning. So the question is, what do we need to resolve this issue of defining extremism? And it sounds really obvious, but what we need is a good definition. Uh, we need some criteria of what makes an extremist an extremist. And then at a more granular level, we need a way of distinguishing between different types of extremism and also different strengths of extremism. So not all extremists are going to have the same level of extremism. Again, it seems quite obvious, but it's worth, uh, worth recognizing. And of course, I'm not the first person to approach this problem. And I think there's always the issue that I could be reinventing the wheel by engaging in this discussion, but actually I, I don't think so. So even though there are lots of definitions, and they do vary in terms of quality and usefulness and applicability, um, there's a lot of problems. And my, my main concern actually is the way about which we apply definitions. And I think we apply definitions very, very poorly at present. So I'm going to try and make this a bit more concrete, because I think that was all quite high level. Um, and I'm going to look at what I study, which is the populist radical right. Uh, so this is a party family that's found mostly in Western and Central Europe. Uh, it's had some really significant electoral successes, though it hasn't ever really taken power yet. Um, examples I have here are the most well known. So we've got Jobbik, Blams Bloc, UKIP, the National Front, and the Freedom Party of Austria. Um, and the book right here is Populist Radical Right Parties in Europe from Kasmuda, 2007, and that's considered to be the sort of uh, leading text in the field. If you really want to get a grasp of what this term means, that's the place you look. Oh. Um, and the thing about the Populist Radical Right is that it's sort of on the cusp of extremism. So there's a lot of debate about what the relationship of these parties is with democracy and freedom and, say, multiculturalism. But overall, the jury, I think, is still out. We still don't really know what these parties, um, what the impact of them will be. They tend not to have outright racist or anti-democratic views, but they certainly attract a lot of voters who do have such views. And in many cases, it's unclear exactly what their platform is. So very quickly, the basis of a populist radical right party is a combination of authority, nativism, and populism. So authoritarianism, a lot of respect for the rule of law, a lot of interest in order, and a very narrow definition of what justice is. Uh, nativism is the idea of an in-group and an out-group, so you support the people who are part of your in-group, which in this case is normally defined 
on the basis of ethnicity or some cultural homogeneity, and then you exclude or marginalize those who aren't part of that. And then populism is an anti-elitist uh, rejection, normally on the basis of corruption or that the people, sorry, that the elite aren't listening to the people. Um, and yeah, and those three components are what makes up the populist radical right. So the question is, I think, how do we actually make use of this definition? Um, but at this point, I want to have a very brief interlude. Um, so I don't want to spend too much time exploring the philosophy of science behind my arguments, because I don't think it's actually that useful. I don't think it's that important. But it is key just to make one small distinction. Um, and that's the difference between a deductive and an inductive approach to definitions. So deduction versus induction. Um, very quickly, in a deductive approach, we start from theory. We develop criteria or hypotheses, and then we see how these can be applied to the social reality, which is our data. And in an inductive approach, we start from the data, and then we allow a theoretical or conceptual device to emerge. So very simple, in deduction, we start from theory and go to data. Induction, we start from data and go to theory. Now, neither approach is really entirely satisfactory. So if we are deductive, then we risk making a definition that is not very relevant. But if we're inductive, then we make something that is too narrow and might not be applicable to wider phenomena. Um, but for me, the winner is definitely deduction. I don't think, I think that's a very common viewpoint. I think that uh, most of us, when we do research, we're acting deductively. Um, and I think it's important that when we do research, we do at some point clearly specify what our definition is and then try to apply it rigorously, even if we use inductive methods to get there. Um, so, for example, if we use the government definition of extremism, or if I use Kasmuda's definition of extremism, or if I say something far more general, like the basis of extremism is the use of political violence, then effectively what I'm being is deductive because I'm starting with a theory and I'm seeing how I can apply it to the social reality. Um, I think that's just quite an important caveat to sort of understand where my argument is going, is to understand that it's, it's deductive. So this is the really key bit. So we now want to try and operationalize our definition. Let's say we take Kasmuda's definition of populist radical right as authoritarianism, nativism, and populism. Um, and so we could do one of two things normally, either a maximum criteria or a minimum criteria. So in a maximum criteria, we try to establish, say, five or six or seven things which make that party fit into the category of populist radical right. Um, the problem that we have when we have such a stringent and difficult criteria is that we get a lot of false negatives. We get a lot of parties which don't fit into our criteria, even though we think they should. Um, but on the flip side, if we have a minimum criteria, so we say only identify two or three things, very simple, you know, it's not very hard to meet that criteria, we're going to have a lot of false positives. We're going to start classifying a lot of parties which we don't think should be considered part of the populist radical right as part of it. Um, and I think these are sort of inescapable problems if you, if you do it the normal way. And you just have to decide which one you think is worse. Um, or you could, of course, just completely ignore the question altogether, which is what a lot of people do. Um, but that brings with it its own problems. So now we move on to what, what my argument is. And my argument is that we need to, well, my, my argument is that we need to make sure that when we're characterizing organizations, we don't try and oversimplify those organizations. Um, so my, my real beef, I guess, is that we use absolutes. And I don't think absolutes are the way forward. I think that the social world is inherently complex and uncertain, and that to try and reduce that uncertainty by reducing parties to, to one single label is ultimately going to fail. Um, so most definitions try to say, or they're posed in a way which says, this party is X. Labour is a social democratic party. The Greens are a left-wing, eco-friendly organisation, which in some cases might be fine. And it's definitely easier for government and for media to digest because it's very simple. You say, you know, this is this. 
it's not that difficult. Um, but there's a lot of problems with giving an absolute, part, um, absolute answer. And I think it's really detrimental to the robustness and respectability of our findings when we know that our definitions aren't working that well, but we just continue to use them because they're simple. Um, so my argument is that rather than trying to mangle what we do so that we include all the parties we want to describe or we can explain how those parties are different, we should just move to probabilities because probabilities provide a much simpler and more elegant way of understanding how to characterize parties. So I'm going to try and explain this by actually just going through what I would do. Um, so I think that makes this, I think just makes it a little bit easier. So first of all, we make a typology, which involves picking some definitions. Uh, and I've just picked four here, which are very widely used in the literature on the far right. So the extreme right, the far right, the populist radical right, and the conservative right. Four different types of party families, which are sort of terms which are thrown around a lot in the literature and which seem to be quite applicable to different sorts of organizations. Um, so th this is our typology. And now step two is that we have an organization, here I've used the Front National in France, that we want to categorize in some way. And the question is, which one of these four best um, characterizes this group? Um, but as I'm sure is not entirely unexpected, I would say that we're asking the wrong question by posing the question in this way. So rather than saying which, um, which label best describes the Front National, I think we should ask which category is it most likely to fit into? Um, and by doing this, we move from absolute statements or categories to probabilistic statements or hypotheses. So I'm not describing the National Front as anything. I'm hypothesizing that it could be this particular category rather than any of the other categories. Um, and in so doing, I then want to um, calculate a probability and also do this for all of the other categories. And then this gives me an idea of what it is. So rather than having this binary absolute yes, no, it is either x or it is y, and it cannot be both, or it's clear, clearly one or the other, I try to capture the fact that there's competing evidence that supports different positions. Now, again, I don't really want to go into how I'm going to do this, because I think there's some very challenging methodological problems. Um, and actually, I haven't yet done any data collection. I'm still trying to work out what the theory is. I'm still trying to work out if this is a useful or interesting way of going about it. Um, but based on what I've done so far, and based on my previous research and um, using statistics, I think it's likely that a Bayesian methodology will be really, really valuable for doing this. Because essentially, what I'm trying to do is to quantify uncertainty. I think there's uncertainty around how parties and organizations should be characterized. And I think we want to capture that uncertainty in our definitions rather than just trying to pretend that it doesn't exist. Um, but anyway, as I said, this is for another time because it's quite a complex issue in itself. So again, this isn't real data. This is just made up. Of course, it clearly is going to show all of my own biases. Um, but I think it's sort of vaguely reasonable. So I've said extreme right, there's a 0 0.03 probability. Far right, 0.1. Populist radical right, 0.62. And conservative right, 0.25. And of course, they total 1. Because in this scheme, the party must belong to at least one category. Um, right, so, so here I've got 0.62 for the populist radical right. Uh, this means that it's more likely than not that the party belongs to that category. Uh, but my view is that we should not then jump to the conclusion that it is the populist radical right, that that is the right thing. Instead, we should stay with the probabilities. Rather than being forced to pick any one of these options, we should say, this is the picture. This is the best we can do. This is the most certain that I can be is just to look at this and say, that's, that's the data I've got. And then ideally, you could do this with time analysis or with comparison across different parties. And I think you would then get some really interesting insights into the more nuanced and granular level of party analysis. Um, and I think just one, one final point on this is that what I'm not saying is that it's a hybrid. So a hybrid is something very different. A hybrid is where you go, it's 3% extreme right and 62% populist radical right and 10% far right. And it's a sort of mixed match of, so 
sorry, mismatch of all those things together. And that's definitely not what I'm saying. Um, it's really important to recognize that probabilities aren't hybrids, and so we can't just easily parcel it off into these separate uh, categories. OK, so um, I'm going to finish now by closing remarks. Um, I'd like to just quickly review what I've gone over. Um, so first of all, very basic, we need a definition of extremism. Uh, and at a more granular level, we need to have a typology that captures different ideological types of extremism and different strengths of extremism. I think this is really integral to any research project. Second, current approaches are really limited because they result in either a lot of false negatives or a lot of false positives, and that problem is just almost impossible to resolve. Uh, third, the problem is perhaps not with our current definitions and typologies, but rather with the way in which we're applying them and the way in which we understand our definitions. Fourth, uh, the social world is very complex, so I think we need to capture that rather than ignoring it. And then fifth, my answer is to get probabilistic. Um, I think by treating categories as hypotheses and then applying those pro hypotheses probabilistically, we could reflect the uncertainty of our definitions, and this would lead to much more interesting insights and a much better way of characterizing parties, and then would allow us to go on and answer more interesting research questions, and perhaps to do so in a more politically aware and sensitive manner. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Uh, I just want to draw your attention back to Oxen, which is the network through which we're doing these uh, lectures. And yeah, thank you very much for listening.